professor Marco Kockeberg, ehm, che insegna filosofia dei media e tecnologia presso l'Università eh, di Vienna, eh, è vicepresidente della facoltà di filosofia e formazione ed è stato presidente della società per la filosofia e la tecnologia. Um, la sua ricerca ruota essenzialmente intorno a questioni di eh, etica e tecnologia, con particolare riguardo alla uh, robotica e all'intelligenza artificiale. Uh, il professor Kockelberg è membro di diversi enti, la cui attività è volta alla costruzione di politiche nelle aree della robotica e dell'intelligenza artificiale, come per esempio il gruppo di esperti di alto livello della, com della Commissione europea sull'intelligenza artificiale, artificiale, il Consiglio austriaco sulla robotica e l'intelligenza artificiale e il Consiglio consultivo austriaco sulla mobilità automatizzata. È autore di un gran numero di libri, di moltissimi saggi, ehm, tutti questi lavori tradotti in molte lingue e eh, partecipa a diversi progetti di ricerca europei sulla eh, robotica, come per esempio il progetto eh, Perseo. Um, terrà per noi um, due lezioni, una oggi uh, e una domani alla stessa ora, quattro e mezzo, e terrà poi lunedì prossimo una Picarello uh, Lecture presso il Dipartimento di Fisica uh, Ettore Pancini. Anche questa lecture verrà um, trasmessa tramite Zoom e penso anche tramite Teams. No, anzi, sicuramente anche tramite Teams. Benissimo, a questo punto um, io um, do la parola direttamente al uh, professor Kockerberg e uh, vi ringrazio per essere presenti. Ok, so let me get started. So I will talk about AI ethics. Uh, so it's loosely based on the book also with the same name, AI ethics with uh, MIT Press. Um, but I focus on a question concerning responsibility. Um, in, uh, in the context of AI, robotics, and other automation technologies. Um, so first I will say a bit about uh, the, the narratives that are about AI, then I will look at the problem of responsibility, and then I, um, I put it in the context of global problems. So first, what is AI? Well, what we have in the discourse about AI is uh, uh, different kind of narratives about AI, and one dominant one is one that presents uh, artificial intelligence as this um, science fiction kind of entity which uh, has a general, art general artificial intelligence, meaning that it has an intelligence like we humans do. Um, but this is science fiction, so what actually happens is that we um, frame technology sometimes in, a, in our cultural context, and our cultural context is one in which we um, imagine the future of technology. So technology is not only uh, these things that we have, technologies is also the stories about technologies and our um, projections of the future. Uh, and this stands in a, uh, to, to project AI as a human-like entity stands in a, a, a long tradition, um, starting at least in the 19th century, but also earlier, uh, for example, with um, the novel Frankenstein, where there is, uh, which can be read as being about technology that uh, gets out of control. And then the question is, why is that so? And here immediately a question about responsibility, responsibility comes up, because one could say that um, it's not so much the fault of the technology, here the, the monster um, uh, to run away, but it's more the fault of the one who created the uh, monster um, and is, is responsible for making it and lets it run, uh, lets it out of control. Uh, so it could be read as a story about humans uh, needing to be very careful and very ethical about technology, because if we just let the development of technology take its course without the ethics and the humanistic um, uh, angle, then uh, we are in trouble. In my book on uh, uh, romanticism and technology called New Romantic Cyborgs, I looked further into this kind of history in the 19th century, this history of thinking about technology. Um, but so I think on the one hand, we need to do that. But when it comes to the, the ethics of AI today, we really need to um, 
not focus too much on the science fiction and to uh, to see what there is. And there is no such thing as general AI today. What there is is the apps we use in our phone, which are often connected to AI. For example, when we do a, a Google search, something that we do so often um, in in a day, and the related problems. And so, what I would like to focus on today is to uh, say, okay, there are these um, real-world ethical problems and responsibility is one of them. So in my book, AI Ethics, as you will see or have seen, uh, there are, uh, there's a list of ethical problems. Uh, will technology replace us? What would, will be the future of work? Um, what kind of privacy and data protection issues are raised? What kind of issues are raised also in the context of, of a capitalist system where, where we also have this technology embedded in it and what does it mean for thinking about technology the safety also um, in an industrial context um, which i believe is also a, a very actual problem in italy uh, then vulnerable users like if we make technology that gets into the hand of children and not only adults what does that mean how can we protect children from the um, exploitation and the attachment and other phenomena that that psychologically are created and encouraged often by the industry because the tech industry wants our data and wants to um, uh, use people and the question is if in case of children is perhaps more ethically problematic also um, the transparency of artificial intelligence in particular um, as you might know, there are some forms of artificial intelligence that work with deep learning where it's not so clear how the machine gets to a certain recommendation, a certain decision. And um, this is problematic, as I will, as I will show later in this um, talk uh, for responsibility. Um, another ethical problem is, is bias in uh, algorithms, uh, bias that is created in, in various stages. Uh, again, I will come back to that. Um, we should also see the, the discussion about AI in, in a context um, that is more political, and I will talk tomorrow more about democracy. Um, today, I want to highlight here that there are, of course, um, uh, issues concerning gender, uh, skin color, race, however, it a lot depends how one uh, frames this. Um, but it's clear that technology is embedded in our society and um, when data science and AI uses um, material from that society is connected to the meanings in our society, then it can also um, yeah, recreate the biases, maintain the biases that are in our society. Um, so that's an, an important issue today. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I've been thinking about this question about the, the meaning of technology in a more societal and cultural framework. Um, so the way I did that was in um, uh, in this book, using words and things, where I where I um, argued. Okay, where, where I argued that. Um, Technology is always embedded in a cultural context via structures that are there in our society. And I used Wittgensteinian terms there and uh, made them uh, fit to technology. Um, the idea was that just as language is connected to games and to a form of life, that also our technological objects are not just like word objects that are isolated from culture, but are part of how we do things in our society, in our culture. And so the terms technology, games, and form of life played a role in, um, in that research. So let's now focus on responsibility. Um, Lorenzo, please let me know when I talk too long, but I think we have the time for, for this. Um, I just wanted to give the brief overview and now go into more details. So let's talk about responsibility. Um, so responsibility, in, in particular moral responsibility, is um, known to many philosophers, right? So it's, a, it's a topic that, you know, it's very long-standing discussions uh, in, in uh, moral philosophy, especially in, in uh, 
uh, also in applied ethics in particular areas. Um, and so what does it mean to talk about responsibility in the context of AI? What does responsibility mean there? And um, what, what kind of specific problems are created by this new technology, by artificial intelligence? So AI is already there. So we, what we already see in terms of um, the consequences uh, is that, that there are certain um, consequences or at least certain risks. So let's say that from a utilitarian point of view, we can already uh, point to different risks and consequences um, that, that are there. So, so um, for example, the machines that harm workers in a factory, um, but also AI that cause, can cause a crash on financial markets, um, a care robot, if it's used in a hospital context, imagine that it could give the, the wrong medication to a patient. Um, there is also robots in a military context. And in all these cases, if something goes wrong or could go wrong, if there is this risk, the question is, of course, and who is responsible, given that this technology uh, enables a certain level of automation. And to one example uh, that relates to this problem of bias, and that also shows how we real world consequences can have. Um, another example is one that, that um, happened in Michigan where a man was arrested for a crime he did not commit, but the, the judicial system used AI uh, with facial recognition and on the basis of the AI, uh, this person was arrested. Uh, so that's quite quite a big impact on this person's personal life. Yeah, if you're arrested in front of your wife and children, in this case, and so um, uh, interestingly, one of the police people said afterwards, "I guess the computer got it wrong." Um, so this is actually something that has already happened, and that for sure might happen in the future. That we defer responsibility to the machine, that we don't take responsibility for what machines do. Um, the same can happen in an insurance context, in a social, uh, in a context where you get social benefits, for example. This has huge impact on people's life, right? Whether someone is put in prison, where someone can live from a state. Uh, pension, for example, these are these are important, um, uh, morally relevant consequences. So I think it's important to think about responsibility and especially the question: How can we be responsible for these automation technologies, including AI? So the question is not: uh, Are we responsible? Because I think many of us agree that we should be responsible as humans for what the machines do. But I find the more interesting question, how can we be responsible? And for that, I will look into um, uh, Aristotelian conditions for responsibility. So when it comes to the attribution of responsibility, um, I think there are two kind of conditions that need to be fulfilled since Aristotle before we actually give responsibility to, to someone. And, and so before someone can take responsibility. One is that the person has to actually do it and be in voluntary control of it. Yeah, so usually when someone um, um, is, uh, well, basically, if, if something happened and someone is totally not involved in it in, in any way, we won't hold that person responsible. So we'll only hold people responsible if they did something that is related to, to the event. Um, so that, that's the first condition. Um, and it relates to the question, who or what is the agent of responsibility? Um, and so, as I said, the technology, let's not hold the technology responsible. Why not? Because it lacks the required moral agency capacities, traditional ones like free will. Um, one could also, according to other theories, say like emotions are important for moral a reasoning and moral judgment, but if that's the case, then again, machines do, do not uh, fulfill conditions for moral agency. Humans can do, but the question is then who is responsible? Um, this is a case to think about this. In Arizona, there was a crash uh, where a pedestrian died in 2018, and um, earlier there was also an, an accident with Tesla. Well, if we try to ascribe responsibility there, then a typical thing in the technological context is that 
the agent of responsibility, the agent that has control over what happened, that is also causally related to the, the event, it's not just one person, it's always many persons. And we, we tend to say the problem, call it the problem of many hands in the technological context. Um, and one can see that also when one connects this with legal uh, matters, uh, sorry, legal, uh, legal concepts and instruments. For example, um, tort law says you, as a driver, you need to exercise reasonable care. But the question is, what does that mean if, in a, if, if a car is self-driving and you're just an, an operator, but not really the driver, right? So you don't have direct control, uh, but still you're supposed to not be negligent to, to exercise care. So the, the operator, uh, previously called the driver, um, is, is one of the people that we want to distribute responsibility to, but we have this problem. Um, there's also pr uh, product liability from a legal point of view, and that points to the, um, the producers of the technology. But there too, it's not so easy, right? So do we really want to say that anything that happens is the moral responsibility of the, the people who programmed this car? Um, maybe there are other parties involved. Um, but again, it's one of the, the moral agents here uh, you know, that, that, that um, we can look at. Um, one should also include the pedestrians, so um, also pedestrians can be at fault if they're not supposed to cross somewhere or if they suddenly run on, on, the, on the drive uh, on, on the road. Um, and even the regulator can be seen as carrying some responsibility because in this case, in contrast to Europe here, the regulators in the US let these cars on the road. There is already many kilometers made by self-driving cars in California, for example, in Nevada and so on. Um, if something happens, then one could also say like, yeah, but you didn't put the right regulation in place. Um, again, not so clear, right? So to what extent is then the regulator responsible? Um, for me, it was also interesting in the last years to look more at temporal dimensions of technology. And um, here that's also very clear because in, uh, when it comes to AI and data science, um, it, it, there is not just this one moment, for example, the moment when an accident happens or the moments of use of the technology. There's in fact like a whole history, um, uh, a causal history also, where um, data are collected, um, for example, by a sensor in the car in this case, um, but also data are collected by human beings making a data set uh, training an algorithm on the basis of the data set. Things are done with this data. Um, later, there is a training and also the, the use then of the algorithm that's already trained. The data that the algorithm is used on can be different than the data that are used for the training of the algorithm. So technically speaking, there is a whole process. Uh, AI is not just this thing, but it, it, one could say it's a process it's, and there's a history of people and things. And uh, responsibility attribution can be very difficult because of this causal history. So this was the control condition, right? So, so in order to be responsible, one has to do, uh, do it and do it voluntarily. Um, but it, it showed that, it, that I showed that it was not so easy. Um, the second condition has to do with knowledge. I'm particularly interested in that one. So basically, you're responsible when you know what you're doing and to the extent that you know what you're doing. So typically we will not hold, uh, for example, a baby responsible for um, causing an accident um, or we will not hold, um, for example, a, a dog responsible for, for um, killing a human being in a certain situation because we say like, yeah, this person or this animal doesn't know what it's doing, right? Um, but, but adult people in good mental health and so on, we do, we do uh, hold them responsible. And um, so the question is always how much did you know what you're doing? Um, and in the individual case that can for, be, for example, a question when they're in, to, to go back to the traffic case, if someone is, um, if someone is, 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 uh, is drunk, right? So that person doesn't fully know 
what he or she is doing, but, but what does it mean then for responsibility? So that already makes things more difficult. Um, but again, in the technological context, we have, uh, we have a problem. Um, I wanted to go to the next slide, but somehow... Ah, okay, yes. Um, and, and here I, I want to go back to Aristotle. Um, Aristotle talks about the, the ignorance, one could say the moral ignorance, uh, that renders responsibility uh, ascription difficult. And uh, he says a man may be ignorant then of who he is, <clears throat> what he is doing, uh, that we just talked about, then what or whom he is acting on, and sometimes also what the instrument he is doing it with, and to what end, and how he is doing it. And in this how, and especially the instrument, of course, we have the technology in, 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 uh, for our purposes. And often people ignore that uh, most philosophers working on moral responsibility are talking about the, 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 the what and, and, and sometimes the, the what or whom people are acting on and the ends, but, but not the instrument. So I think this has been unduly ignored in the history of moral philosophy. Uh, but as philosophers of technology, we have to be sensitive to that. And so let's look then at what this means in this context. So we have users, programmers of AI, um, so what kind of ignorance plays there? Well, one, one kind of ignorance has to, um, has to do with, with, um, with goals, because um, so Aristotle talk about the, uh, talks about the goal, but often the problem is that the, the consequences um, of, the, of the technologies are unintended, right? So um, programmers do not intend that a car causes an accident, of course. Um, yet it might have that. Or for example, bias. Almost no one will design a technology that is in, explicitly meant to be biased. Yeah? Uh, of course, one have a, can have a thought experiment, for example, a, a fascist regime that, that uh, has an AI that is explicitly biased. Uh, but, but usually, we, uh, today, luckily, we don't have that. So unintended consequences are very important, morally speaking, uh, in, in the philosophy, in the technology context. But the question is how to deal with that because we are used to blame people, for example, to also ascribe responsibility for intended consequences. Um, but there is a lot of unintended stuff happening and um, that has to do also with the ignorance about the instrument, uh, to, to, to use the Aristotelian term. Because even if technical people who program a certain algorithm or program um, AI, even if they know very well what they're doing in their specific domain, and at that moment of, of time, they might be ignorant about other phases of the process, for example, about how the data have been collected. Um, for example, they, they, um, they program and use um, a facial recognition algorithm, but as, happen, as it turns out, this algorithm has been trained on data of only um, uh, white faces. Yeah? And it's then used, for example, in an American context, in an urban context where there's a lot of diversity in a particular context, uh, uh, in particular countries and so on, where there's a lot of diversity of people of color. So uh, when, when this uh, happens, it might be that the programmers themselves, uh, they did not intend that, but they were ignorant about their instrument in the sense that they forgot about this whole history uh, uh, of, of how, in a way, this technology was made. And they just focused on their part and what they had to do. And this, so this is a problem. Um, and if we want to do something about that, we have to, we have to uh, open up this kind of historical uh, context and also the, 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 the social context um, uh, and, and the temporal context. Then, then another uh, thing that might happen is that experts don't, don't, don't really know what the other one was doing and do not understand how the others uh, do things. Uh, for example, I talk to, to people who work more in an industrial context and they tell me that, that sometimes data scientists do their thing and the engineers do their other thing. And of course, they are trained in a different way and have a different uh, epistemic world, right? And, and so they might not understand really 
what the other is doing. So imagine the engineer of our self-driving car who knows a lot about cars, uh, but does not really know um, a lot about how the data scientist made the, 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 the algorithm they're using in that car. Um, and then in the end, there is like, even if the technical people have not so much ignorance, the, the, the operator might be ignorant. For example, if I flew to Naples in an airplane, I do not really know how the airplane works. I do not fully know. Yeah? I, I, I know about this, this lift and I, and I know some of the physics and I know some, some things, but, but I do not know enough to really understand. Um, of, and, and you know, that's one reason why, why um, someone famously said that, that advanced technology is a kind of magic, right? Because for most of us, we don't really fully understand scientifically and technically how things work. Nevertheless, we use it. And this is in the case of AI also the case. So if, if I imagine I would get into a self-driving taxi in, in, a, in an American city, because here I think in Naples or in Vienna, it it's, would be a disaster because uh, <laughs> it's too complex a situation. But in, of course, in the US, often the, the streets are straight and the situation is maybe a bit easier for engineers to deal with. Um, but so imagine I do that and I go into that self-driving car, but of course I do not really know how this car works and I do not really know how this algorithm that drives my car, how it makes the decisions. And nevertheless, my life depends on it and the life of other people depends on it, right? So morally relevant risks and consequences. Um, so, so that creates again a problem in terms of agency, but also in terms of uh, knowledge and ignorance, um, and therefore a problem with responsibility, because there is again a sense in which I cannot be fully responsible. So even if we morally all want to say humans should be responsible, but we cannot be fully responsible because we have delegated um, these decisions to, um, to a machine. Now, what I then uh, then added, so this analysis I, I did on the basis of this Aristotelian distinction, but then um, later I, I added also something else, and that refers to, if we go back to the Aristotelian definition, um, let's go, let's go literally back. So, um, uh, uh, what or whom he is acting on, um, but it's not only in a in a causal sense, and and I will explain now what I mean. So the question I think we have to ask with regard to responsibility is about agency, who did it? But it's also about uh, uh, knowledge, right? What did the person know? Um, and I think then we also should um, add a third question. And the third question is the question, to whom are we responsible? Um, so this is not about the agent and the knowledge of the agent, but it's about the, 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 one could say the, the second person. So, so, so I open it up from this focus on the individual agent who does things and knows things to a, to a more social uh, view and a more relational view. And one of my sources of inspiration for that, I mean, another source is, for example, posthumanism and, and also I've been, always, and I've been working on a relational view on moral status. Um, but but in, in, in this case, one, another source of inspiration was for me legal philosophy, where there is already a view that says that responsibility always involves a relationship where there is not only this agent, but also where there, there are others who hold that agent into, uh, hold that agent to account. And um, in the work of Dove, that means that yeah, I'm accountable for something, and we've been talking about this some things, for example, this, the behavior of the self-driving car, but I'm also held accountable for something by uh, some, someone else, um, and ret retrospectively, um, if, if something fails, I'm, I'm held accountable. Another word is answerable, so I'm uh, held answerable for, for what I do. For example, if I um, uh, go on the street here, then drive a car uh, as, a, as a human driver, um, I'm held accountable. I have to answer if I cause an accident with a pedestrian, then 
in a way society as a whole in, in, in juridical form asks me what you know what the hell were you doing right so that's the the, the control agency expect uh, what did you know where you're drunk for example and also the, the third thing is that yeah I'm asked in a way um, or can be asked to to answer for it uh, because I, I have this uh, duty towards others um, and of course that includes the the persons who can put potentially be harmed by my behavior. Um, and, and that also brings in practical uh, reasoning, for example, right? Because when when I have to answer or should potentially answer, then I, as a human being, I give reasons for what I did. It's not just a causal explanation that is asked for me. I have to give reasons. And that can be in the legal context for the court, but also uh, um, morally speaking, uh, so others can, in principle, ask me, and so therefore, to be responsible means to be answerable. So I'm able to answer, and I find that very interesting way of thinking about responsibility because it brings in this social aspect. There is this dyadic relationship. I'm not only responsible for something, but also towards specific people and towards society as a whole. And so I think that brings in a distinction also between agency and patiency. I've been working in the moral status area about patiency always. And um, so in, in this way, one can bring in also patiency that there are people who can be potentially harmed, can be potentially be in the position of the one who holds me accountable. Um, so if we go back to the traffic case, um, it can be the pedestrian that 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 is at risk um, or the pedestrian that's harmed in the case of, um, of of an airplane it can be for example the family members of someone who, who uh, uh, died in a, in a plane crash so um, there, it's about concrete people and it's also more abstractly about that someone can hold me can can ask me always to to answer and um, so the the they are part of the people who, who are moral patients rather than moral agents. So I think in moral responsibility, that should be part of the picture. Um, and if we think about that, if we have that kind of sketchy framework, then the question is like, okay, if we don't have technologies, well, we cannot really expect this from technology that the technology is answerable. Um, only humans can give reasons can give answers. Um, the, of course, a machine can give some causal explanations, but sometimes AI cannot give an, an, uh, an explanation even. And um, so it means that humans have to do that, I think, that so to, so to hold someone responsible, uh, to ascribe responsibility in the technological case, that means that there should always be humans who can be answerable. Um, for, for this, um, but you can see how difficult that is in the case of AI when there is no transparency, when we don't really know how the AI came to a result, because then we are asking the human, like, yeah, give me an answer, for example, why the plane went down, but the autopilot cannot really give the answer because it used a type of machine learning where it's not clear how it decided. But still we, we expect this answer from the human, so that it creates I think huge uh, problems. Um, also in a military context, for example, if you have an automatic uh, missile defense system, which has to work very fast, it's a temporal dimension, uh, the same in traffic has to go fast, right? So fast decisions made by the technology and afterwards humans have to be answerable, but cannot really give an answer because everything went very fast. The technology made a decision that's not transparent. And, um, and so, to, to be responsible and to ascribe responsibility here is, is problematic. Um, there's, there's more about this relational part in, in this paper, uh, if, if, if you're interested. And um, yeah, uh, I'm also very interested in those of you who are busy with, with um, 
both more practical philosophy, moral philosophy, and also people who are working on epistemology. It would be, I think, nice to further discuss this. Um, if we have this situation, then one could also, um, you know, as you um, might know, I've also been involved in policy making uh, indirectly, right through advice. And so the question is like, if, if we have this very problematic situation, how then to deal with this from a more uh, policy perspective? What, you know, and, and then as a society, what should we do? So of course, first of all, technically, we can try to develop technology that's more transparent. Um, but it remains very difficult because um, the so-called good old-fashioned AI used to have decision trees, so we humans put put in a way the knowledge into the machine, and so we can very easily answer uh, why the machine made the decision. But in these certain types of machine learning that I mentioned, it's not possible. So how to how to do that technically? Uh, that machines can. Uh, give explanations at least, um, which they can then be used by, by humans in, in their reasoning. Um, one can do regulation. Uh, the question is, should we forbid maybe certain kinds of AI, uses of AI, because of the problems that I said? Or if not, can, should, we, uh, should we demand from the technical people to design the technology in such a way that these types of ignorance are, are you know, at least less problematic or, uh, or that there is less ignorance created. And also if we think about the to whom, I think it's good to, to ask the people, right? So morally speaking, um, often this, this triadic relation is, uh, or this, this third kind of thing, this to whom is forgotten. So people, moral philosophers think about this agent and the knowledge of the agent in an individualistic way and, and forget that this is also about these moral patients. So in the case of self-driving cars, one should ask the pedestrian. And um, it's not only important in the case of AI. I think now already, if we have the traffic, we often um, forget the, the moral patient. Um, we, we don't really ask the, the, the people that can be harmed. We, we, uh, we tend to uh, yeah, uh, focus on, on other things. Um, also, if we it's technically, if we say like, yeah, let's develop explainable AI, um, it's not so clear what kind of explanation people need because engineers and, and, and scientists, then they say like, okay, no problem. We will provide some kind of technical explanation. For example, are you, you are ignorant about your instrument, the, 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 the car, then we will, uh, here is the code of the car. Yeah, but of course, uh, most of us don't understand computer code, cannot read it. And even if we could read it, um, maybe this is not the kind of explanation that we need, need. We need an explanation, for example, why a family member died, or we need an explanation uh, why I'm put at risk uh, when I'm using this, this uh, self-driving car. And that could be a non-technical explanation, or in any case, a, a different kind of explanation that we want. And there's in, in social science and uh, psychology, there's this whole research area about explanation. What, so, so here the, the, the moral attention is again shift towards the, the moral patient. Like what, uh, if we think about answerability, what kind of answer do you want? Yeah, rather than always starting from the technical and just saying like, yeah, this is how it is. And then maybe we need science communication to make it more understandable to people. Now this, this kind of, starts from the from from the people and then says like okay uh, what are the consequences for science and technology so it's uh, i think a fundamentally democratic way of thinking if you if you see it like that then uh, you know being in a city there where there is also a, an ancient influence from the greek culture um, it should not be forgotten that that it's one thing to talk about moral responsibility, but often we, we think about this in a very modern way and we want to assign 100% responsibility to people. But I think uh, responsibility questions are very complicated given that um, our agency in the world is, is limited. Um, and, and if that's the case, there is no such thing as absolute responsibility, right?
right? So we do some things in, in the world, but we're always related to whatever happens to us also. So in that sense, there's a tragic dimension. So for example, in the context of the traffic things, I mean, a lot of accidents, it could also be that you would be just a little bit lucky and that it would not have happened, right? Um, so there, there's the element of luck, there is an element of fate, when there are a lot of philosophical terms for this. Um, I call it the tragic dimension here of, of uh, uh, um, technological action, and uh, that's embedded in the general tra tragic dimension of human life. Uh, in, 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 in modernity, we put a lot of emphasis on on action and what 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 uh, so what people do and what people control and we we want control um, but there is also different ways of thinking uh, for example in 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 Greek uh, ancient Greek culture um, but also modern philosophers such as um, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard have um, have thought about about this uh, tragic dimension so I think it's interesting to. To, to also uh, look at, at this, um, uh, and I've, I've written one paper on, on this in the context of offshore engineering, uh, where I refer to um, Kierkegaard's um, reading of modern, a comment one could say on, on modern theater, saying that there the emphasis is a lot on the what a hero does, uh, but he compares it then to the to ancient tragedies where of course, it's about what the hero does, but there is also ignorance, one could say, right? Um, for, um, for example, in, in Oedipus, right? Uh, um, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a, the hero, but, but there's also a lot that happens to the hero that's beyond the control of the hero and also beyond of the knowledge of the, of the hero. So when we, when we look at these conditions, control and knowledge, I think we should, uh, yeah, reflect more about what this means, this, this tragic dimension. Um, and so I think that's also there in, in technology. Technology also has this tragic dimension. Um, then uh, finally, I think um, we're always talking when it comes to responsibility about humans. Um, but if we think again, uh, yeah, humans are here the, the agents, moral agents, but there's also the, the moral patients. And the, 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 the set of moral patients, I think, um, yeah, we, we often assume that that's the humans, but they're also non-humans. Um, for example, if we go back to the, here to traffic, um, yeah, there, there are also, uh, you know, animals living, uh, non-human animals living in a city. And yeah, these are often forgotten because we, we, we restrict the questions of responsibility to, to humans. And for example, in the technological sphere, we talk about uh, human-centered technology. But how human-centered should it be? Shouldn't we also think about, about these non-humans? And um, maybe we, we cannot be answerable to a non-human animal, right? Uh, a dog cannot understand the kind of human answers we give, like a kind of uh, moral reasoning, for example. Um, but maybe we are answerable to non-humans in, an, in another sense. Uh, and so let, let's think about that. Um, I don't have the final answer there, but I think that's, that's important. And then also, um, yeah, AI, uh, the, the policy about AI, but also responsibility and AI, we can put it in a global context. Uh, there's a global pandemic. Before we talked about climate change, um, there are many global problems, uh, so not only national and, and local problems. And um, the question is always how this kind of responsibility that's often thought about at an individual level, how that relates to, to the global context, um, where there is also, by the way, a tragic dimension, right? So with the pandemic, we try to control as, as, as humanity, also climate change, but yeah. So, so the question is, who is, you know, who is to blame? Who is responsible? But there, there is also the tragic dimension, and um, yeah, uh, technology is always also embedded in this larger ecology of um, of uh, you know, causal chains, histories, um, and 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 problems. So um, yeah, this just as a as a note at the end. 
uh, for example, if we if we say like we're always responsible uh, to people, we're answerable to people, then again, one should even if one does not extend it to non-humans, one should ask uh, which humans, right? Because uh, often we think only about responsibility to those who are near to us and not uh, people uh, in other parts of the world, for example. Um, so th these are questions about the scope of responsibility. Moral philosophers have said a lot of things about this, um, but I think it's also uh, very relevant in, uh, in, the, in the technological context and especially in the technological context, because AI is something that's uh, used everywhere and that also can be easily be transferred from one country to another. Um, so if we say like we should have responsible development of AI here in Italy or in the European Union, then uh, this will have consequences also for other countries. Or for example, the technology that's developed in, in California and in Texas uh, is used here in, in, in Italy, in, in Austria and so on. And uh, it, it means that, that uh, yeah, the, the scope of responsibility is maybe bigger than we think. So uh, and, and how to deal with that, right? So imagine you are someone who develops the next big technology, um, just like the, the computer um, and, and the internet, this kind of uh, technologies. Is it AI? Is it something else? The, the question is, OK, you know, you might have impact not only on, uh, on users uh, that you can think of, but you might have impact on, on, the, on the whole world. Uh, and, and so it's quite a big responsibility maybe to, to bear for people. And how can we deal with that then if it's not individuals that should bear the responsibility, uh, how, how, how to deal with that in a global context. So there are many political questions one could say, also questions about justice that are more global, um, environmental questions, questions regarding climate. Um, uh, problems like global warming, for example, it, it, it's very much related to technology. So if we have technological questions, they are often also related to, to this kind of uh, questions in, 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 um, in the context what's sometimes called the Anthropocene. Um, so humanity as a whole also has a kind of agency, one could say, in the sense that towards nature that, that we really um, have created a situation where we, we control the planet or think that we control the planet. And so all kinds of questions can be asked uh, on that level too. And the question is, what does that mean for me as an individual, for, for an individual engineer also? Um, how, how to deal with that? Um, I think the, the, this relation between global and local uh, comes back again and again also then in this technological context. Um, and I think all that we can conceptualize starting from the, 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 this, the way that we say like responsibility is always a responsible, responsibility to that there is a moral patient. So once we start with that, it doesn't end actually, we, we, we get to all these uh, different questions and this makes things usually complex, but that's, that's how it is. Um, yeah, so in terms of normative views, one can, for example, say like, okay, not only human counts morally, but what does this mean then for AI? Uh, I already uh, said something about that, uh, but it's more something to, to, to think further about. So I think then I, I come to my conclusion so that we have enough time to still also um, uh, discuss a little bit. So I've talked about AI, the narratives about AI, the ethical problems, and especially the problem of responsibility. I presented the relational view. Um, here's a kind of normative view, one could say, um, about what we should do, right? So uh, I think we this this um, descriptive framework of responsibility too can also be seen as a as a you know uh, as being related to a normative view, like we should then. Uh, focus on this too, and we should be more relational and look at this re relationality in a in a way that's not anthropocentric. And after doing that work, I, um, which was mainly in the context of, of ethics of AI, I 
yeah, I came more and more towards political questions. And so this I will talk about tomorrow and on, especially on Monday. Um, first, there was a book, Green Le Leviathan, or the Poetics of Political Liberty, which looked at problems around freedom. And uh, more recently, the political philosophy of AI. So it's that book that I will talk about in Monday. On Monday and, and tomorrow, I will uh, I will select one topic, democracy, and relate that to to uh, uh, term epistemic agency and, and, and say something about democracy and democratic citizenship in um, in the context of AI using those terms. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, for today and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you.